Hey everyone, this is David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. This is going to be a video about the Ioptron CEM120 telescope mount, which I purchased and took delivery of in November of 2023. Now, I'm not going to do a competitive analysis of this mount versus any alternatives in or above its class, but I'm going to share why I purchased the CEM120. First, it's observatory grade, which was a requirement. Second, I'm familiar with the brand and the product line. I own a GEM 45G and a Skyguider Pro. So I understand the design philosophy and product philosophy that Ioptron uses. It has a very favorable price performance ratio. And then finally, given my observatory configuration, it's the least demanding implementation option. I think we all would prefer spending our time capturing, processing, and sharing our data as opposed to installing, configuring, and troubleshooting new gear. So having said that, I, I did all the customary research, and you should do the same before you make uh, any kind of purchase like this. There's a good deal of information out there in various user forums like Cloudy Nights, and there are even a few uh, YouTube videos that you might find helpful as you contemplate this mount. But one issue I found is that the video content on the CEM120 seems to be sparse and it's a little bit dated. So my intent here is to try and fill that void by sharing my experiences with this mount, starting with the unboxing and the inspection of the mount when it was delivered. This is not going to be your typical Christmas day, ripping open the box style video. Uh, given that the CEM120 or any mount for that matter, is a high precision scientific instrument that costs a great deal of money, I'm going to share a more methodical approach. I'll also share some tidbits of knowledge about the CEM120 along the way. Specifically, I'm going to try to address some of the topics that are commonly discussed in the user forums. I'm hopeful that a fresh perspective on some of these topics will, will prove to be useful for others. So let me start right away with one topic that I commonly see, which is whether or not the CEM120 is a portable mount. So Ioptron advertises it at the edge of portability. I'm going to flat out disagree and assert that this mount is absolutely not portable. Uh, this mount does require permanent installation, you know, such as an observatory or a protected permanent pier. You do not want to be lifting and moving this around with any regularity. I consider myself to be relatively fit, and I certainly aggravated my hernia moving this around this week. So no, in my humble opinion, the CEM120 is a non-portable mount. And if you have any doubts about this assertion, let me share my first tidbit uh, and some details here. The mount head itself is 56 pounds or roughly 26 kilograms. The counterweights, and there are two that come in the package, are 22 pounds a piece, or 10 kilograms. The counterweight shaft itself is five pounds to six pounds, roughly, or two to three kilograms. So in total, the mount assembly, depending on whether or not you're using one or two of the counterweights, is going to be somewhere between 83 and 105 pounds or 38 to 48 kilograms. That's just a mount assembly. Now, obviously, if you're interested in the CEM120 or any similarly class mount, you're probably going to be working with a medium to large refractor, reflector, or, or schmidt kazagram whatever format you intend. It's going to be on the large side. So it's not going to be uncommon for your optical assembly to be 50 pounds or more, 20 to 25 kilograms as a starting point. This has a maximum payload potential of 115 pounds or 52 kilograms. And to be portable, you're going to need a tripeer or a heavy duty, a heavy duty tripod, you know, to set this upon. And the Ioptron tripeer itself weighs 42 pounds or 19 kilograms. So if you add all these weights together, you reach easily a couple hundred pounds or 100 kilograms of weight. And, and this weight is bulky and it's awkward. And you would have to move that around at the beginning and end of each session. Perhaps for some out there, this is doable. 
<laughs> but not for me. And uh, with that initial tidbit complete, why don't we jump into the process of, of unboxing and inspecting the mount when it arrives. Okay, here's the workflow that I followed to unbox and inspect the CEM120. My first step was to make sure I was prepared. I generally like to have everything that I'm going to need for the process ready and available well in advance. Upon arrival, I was very careful to inspect the packaging and unbox the mount, the counterweights, and all of the accessories. I took inventory of all the parts and I performed a physical inspection of the components to confirm that there were no issues, particularly with the mount mechanics. I continued with a preliminary check of the electronics to confirm that the main controller could take power and be operated with the hand controller. I also included a basic test of the motors and their controllers to ensure that the mount was slewable without mechanical issues, specifically binding. All the while I took notes, which I used for my emails that I sent to both the vendor and the manufacturer. In my case, the email was a courtesy thank you with a couple of questions. Had things not gone smoothly, that email might have been to report issues and seek follow-up instructions on how to return them out. Thank goodness that wasn't the case. Remember, the goal of this workflow is simply to confirm that the mount is functional, complete, and you have everything that you need in working order in order to move to the next phase, which is the deployment of the mount to your peer. And I'll cover that in a separate workflow. Okay, for me, being prepared begins with the actual order. And I would emphasize that the relationship that you have with your vendor is important, especially with high dollar value transactions such as the mount. Um, if and when you decide to order the CEM120, do speak to a representative at the vendor, at your chosen vendor. It does not matter which vendor you ultimately choose. I happen to have chosen High Point Scientific for this particular purchase, but I have purchased directly from my Optron. I'm a customer of Astronomics, Woodland Hills, b &H Photo, and all the other common sources that we rely on for our, for our gear. But speaking to someone establishes a relationship footing in the event you need support. In my case, I spoke with a gentleman named David Barrett over at High Point Scientific. He was cordial and helpful. And here's what I did. First, I confirmed that the mount was in fact in stock and available. The supply chain simply isn't what it used to be. And having said that, at this time, I don't see problems with the CEM120 in, in any of its three forms, which are the non-EC form, the EC form, and then the dual encoder form. So they seem to be relatively available. I then confirmed the package itself, the packaging is factory sealed. For me, this is a signal to the vendor that I'm not going to accept the product that was returned by another user. I also inquire on the current location of the item. In my case, the item was in their New Jersey warehouse, which is not too far from where I live in New York. And for me, that's a positive. The less traveled, the better. And I also clarified how will it be shipped to me? And I got an estimate of the package arrival date. I wanted to be physically there and present for the delivery. And in many cases, you're going to be required to provide a signature when receiving an item as expensive as this. And finally, I reviewed the vendor return policy and I made sure I understood what the process would be if I needed to follow it. I happen to have submitted my order by phone, but there, of course, you can do that online. Generally, I received, you will receive, as I did, an email confirmation of the order followed by a tracking number once it ships. And in my case, it shipped later that day. You know, I use that tracking number 
because it tells me the window of opportunity that I have to physically prepare for the receipt of these these boxes. And being a nice guy, I actually wanted to be there to help the delivery person move these packages off the truck. And they're very heavy, and uh, there's never any harm in, in lending a helping hand if you can. Okay, in advance of delivery, you will first and foremost need a clean, uncluttered space to work in. Uh, the space should have access to power and perhaps your computer. Uh, these are big boxes and there will be a fair number of parts floating around when you unpack. You don't want to find yourself scratching your head wondering where you just placed something. So your space needs to be ample, uh, clean, uh, so that you can organize and maneuver given the weight and the bulkiness of the mount and some of the parts that come with it. You're going to need a box cutter or a razor knife because when you unpackage the parts, you want to preserve the condition of the boxes to the best of your ability. You're going to save these boxes as you may need them to return the mount to the vendor or perhaps send the mount to the manufacturer for servicing. Or you may eventually resell this mount. Uh, the new buyer is probably going to want the original factory packaging with the sale. Have yourself a microfiber cloth to wipe things down. The cloth is going to help you determine whether or not a blemish is simply dirt or actual cosmetic damage. Print out and read the manual and any documentation that is available from the manufacturer regarding the initial setup of the CEM120. At a minimum, print, the, print and become familiar with a quick start guide. Have a new CR2032 battery re ready for the mount. An Ioptron does not ship one in the package, so you're going to need one to install in the, into the 8410 hand controller. And without that battery, the hand controller will not maintain any date, time, and location settings that you enter into it. If you do intend to connect your computer to the CEM120, you're going to need to do so either with an Ethernet cable or with a USB type A to B cable. You may ultimately choose to take advantage of features in the cable management system input panel. And if that is the case, you're going to need up to two additional USB 2.0 type A to B cables and one USB 3 cable for, for that hub. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, you should have a camera or your cell phone available throughout this process so that you can take pictures. Pictures are part of documenting this workflow. And again, in the event that you have to return the mount or you have any questions regarding the mount, pictures are going to be requested. Finally, just have a basic notepad and a pen so that you can write down any issues you discover along the way or any questions that you might have that you want to pose at the end to the to the vendor or the manufacturer. If you follow these prep steps, it's going to make the entire workflow much easier. Okay, here the boxes are on my second floor workshop, the second floor of my workshop. Uh, the, these are the boxes as they were delivered by Federal Express. Obviously, they look a little bit rough. Uh, they, they've been through some travel. There are signs of indentations and some cuts in the box. However, the, these boxes are, fact, are actually factory sealed. The, this is factory tape. There's no evidence that this was ever opened outside of the factory. Just simply, you know, a box that has uh, some travel history. Uh, I was a little concerned about the gash, but it didn't actually penetrate the outer seal. And uh, overall, the box was able to actually handle my weight with a little pressure on it. So I know that the boxes were sturdy and protective along the way. Packing slip was taken out by FedEx when it was delivered. I made note of my shipping label from High Point Scientific. But overall, I would say that the mount box was looking pretty, pretty healthy considering its travel history. Uh, the big news is that the counterweights, there are now two that ship with the CEM120. They come in a separate box. And the counterweight shaft actually comes in the mount box. At any rate, clearly the counterweight box was in good shape. And, and knowing what's inside, I wasn't worried if this was a little roughed up. But it wasn't. So it all looks very good. 
Okay, we finished inspecting the packaging and making note of any condition issues. We're going to proceed with uh, uh, un unboxing. So the first step, of course, is to use the razor knife to slice down the ioptron tape, do this on top, and do this on the side uh, of the boxes. You do not have to worry about cutting into product because, as we'll see shortly, um, there are inner boxes uh, that protect the product from, uh, from, from this procedure. So once everything is sliced off, we, uh, we can go ahead and open. And when we open, of course, we expected, we see those inner boxes, which uh, are beautifully in pristine condition with the ioptron tape on them. Um, in this case, in the mount, I did, I did notice a little crushing on the inside box and that will remain on my radar as something that needs to be checked. So uh, this uh, exact process was followed uh, for the counterweight boxes. I didn't expect uh, any surprises here. The you know, counterweight boxes, uh, the counterweights can handle some, uh, some pretty heavy uh, banging around. So everything looked great. Uh, brand new boxes, uh, brand new tape. So we're, we're ready for the next step. Okay, now the fun part, which is opening the inner box and getting our first glimpse at, at product. We can see the stainless steel sh counterweight shaft on the left, and uh, we see that there's an accessory box up in the upper right corner. I wanted to take a quick look at that upper left corner, and uh, clearly there was a little bit of damage there, but it looks like the stainless steel shaft did just fine, and not even a blemish. A nice touch from Ioptron in uh, putting a label with the contents of the accessory box. And uh, of course, we're covered with some styrofoam, which I am about to remove. And here we go. We see our amount for the first time, and we're going to take a quick look at it. And first thing we see is stop. <laughs> uh, read this before you go any further. And of course, I've already done that. So I can go ahead and look at the mount surface. Everything looks good. And uh, so I grabbed the peck curve, and I'm hoping that I hit the lottery here, that I'm going to see a relatively flat line here. And uh, lo and behold, it actually looked great. Ioptron promises plus or minus 3.5 arc seconds. And if you look at this curve, the worst I see is roughly around 2 arc seconds. And so otherwise, it's relatively flat, and that is encouraging to see. We'll put that to the test in the field, of course. Uh, but uh, overall good. And, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I like what I'm seeing. I don't, I don't see anything uh, to alarm me about uh, shipping damage or otherwise. So I, I, I go ahead and take a look at the accessories. Of course, there's a power brick that's included, which is used to power the, the main mount board. And uh, it also comes with a, uh, a, a naturally a plug. So uh, the hand controllers in the upper right hand side of the box and this is the 8410, which is their um, uh, most powerful hand controller, I suppose. It's got the largest GoTube database um, and some other features. In comparison, the GEM45 uses the 8407. So everything looks really good. And at this point, I'm, I'm just going to uh, make note of inventory. And then we're going to move on to the next step. Okay, moving on to component inspection, we have the 1.5 inch diameter counterweight shaft with coarse screws on one end, which will screw into the mount perpendicular to the RA axis. And on the other end, we have a safety cap, which uh, screws in nice and tight so that the weights don't slide off the shaft. Okay, next up, the accessory box, which uh, the box itself was you know, obviously in good condition. I don't have any concern that this is an open box um, unit. At any rate, inside we have well-packed accessories and starting with uh, what is a GPS antenna with a mini coaxial connector. And then we have uh, the cable that's used to connect the hand controller to the mount and it's an RJ11 to RJ11. Then there's this interesting pack of uh, a 422 assembly kit basically and it allows you to create your own power and or data cable if you have an application for such. 
And then it got a little different than what I expected. There's a, uh, a DB9 to RJ11 serial cable, and they advertise actually a USB converter, and that, that didn't come. And then oddly, I got two, <laughs> I got these two 2.5 by 5.5 millimeter barrel power connectors. Nice, nice brass hex set. All the fasteners have hex heads. Uh, and then finally, the four mount screws along with the Wi-Fi coaxial cable, mini coaxial cable. So everything looked good. Accessories in place. Okay. Removing the mount from the box uh, is where we need to start to apply a little bit of caution. The very first thing is I'm, I'm showing the saddle and obviously the, 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 the deck axes here. And I want to point out that there are two switches, these gray switches, one on the left, which is the deck gear lock. And then one in the middle, which is the deck axes lock. The the position that these can take one of two, each of them can take one of two positions. They can be either unlocked or locked. Note that the gear, the deck gear, is unlocked. And note that the deck axes is locked. That is the proper position for transporting. Uh, and or installing this mount. What that does is it, it, it releases the worm drive from the worm gear and it locks the axes mechanically so it cannot rotate or spin. And so uh, before you remove the mount, technically you should check that the deck switches and the RA switches, which are similar, same exact sw switch uh, mechanism, are in their proper positions. Unfortunately, you will not be able to check the RA because it's on the other side of the mount. You're going to have to have a little bit of faith that the switches are properly set. And I'll show you that in, in a moment. So what's probably most important right now is how to grip this. The first place that I gripped to lift this out of the box is right along the altitude track on the side of the mount. This is fixed. This plate is a fixed plate, and you're going to get a decent grip if you hold your, your hand there. In this case, my left hand is holding just, by, just behind the altitude uh, track. The second grip um, is up top near the the deck axes. I know the deck isn't going to swing because I see the levers in the proper lock position. This allows me to pull on the mount from back and top slowly, and it, I will immediately know whether or not the RA axis is properly set and if it's not then I can I can stop and in my case it was fine but you, you do need to be careful and this is very heavy you should be doing this near where the mount ultimately is going to wind up and in my case it wound up uh, on top of a giant's blanket <laughs> uh, on a small sturdy uh, coffee table and here you can see the mount in its you know unboxed position and just for clarity, um, you'll notice that I'm revealing the switches on the RA side, the RA, I'm sorry, the RA axis. And you'll see that the axis is indeed locked. That's the top switch. And the gear, the RA gear, is unlocked. And again, this is the position uh, of transporting and or in installing the mount. I'll point one thing out which is that the documentation suggests that the axes levers, whether it's RA or deck, it's a matter of simply turning them right or left, right to, in this case, right to unlock, left to lock. But that is not the case, and at least not in this generation of the mount. You actually need to pull the axes switch out, so you lift it up, 
and then you can twist it. And so um, there's a two-step motion relative to the axes. That is not the case with the gear lever. The gear lever is a clean motion to right or left, in this case, right to lock or left to unlock. Under no circumstances should you power on the mount with the gear locked and the axes locked. This applies to both RA and deck. Um, once that gear is locked, if for whatever reason, if the mount is to uh, begin motion, you're going to, you're going to have a horrible binding situation. So just be very sensitive to these switches. They are intuitive and, but, but, uh, you know, just be, be sure before you move the mount and or turn it on that the switches are in the position that you're looking for. starting with is the base plate which uh, obviously uh, has the base mounting holes there's four one on, one on each corner of the mount and uh, these are non-threaded holes in which the base screw will slide down and into it's a little bit of play in there but this base plate sits on top of, in my case, the Ioptron permanent pier, which mates. There are holes in the top of that pier plate that this threaded uh, screw will go into. There's a lip here um, at the base of the screw, and there's a lip down here um, at the surface of this plate. And I guess that is going to act as some kind of uh, stabilizer. Uh, and the pressure of this being pulled down on all four corners uh, and that lip intersection here will uh, presumably hold the mount steady. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I suspect that that will be the case. Now, uh, also, um, just I've already started to adjust the uh, altitude of the mount. Really uh, qu quite nice when compared to other... Um, other mounts that I've worked with, even even the GEM 45, they all work similar mechanism. There's a there's a, a worm uh, gear, and then there's this ability to uh, find adjust things by turning just turning this ever so slightly, um, and very very butterly butter you know butter smooth. Of course. Um, the uh, there are some locking bolts on either side of the mount that you would use to tighten down when you're when you're happy with your with your uh, altitude setting. You would tighten it down. I'm not yet happy, so about a quarter of a turn is all you need to allow this to run run smoothly. Um, same thing here. It's about a quarter of a turn out from tight. Now I'll point out that you know. Remember, going in one direction, it's, butter, it's buttery smooth. It might be a little bit trickier in the other direction. Uh, it might not feel as buttery smooth, but it's just because it's working with the mass of the mount. So I wouldn't, wouldn't panic about that. It's actually, it feels really good. Uh, I'll say the same exact thing for the azimuth adjustment. I'm a real fan of this. Uh, um, first of all, I, the fact that there are tick marks that... Uh, uh, with a range here, of uh, that I think that's really important. Um, uh, but very, very easy to adjust these. Um, and when compared to other other mounts, uh, including the GM GEM 45, where you know it's actually not that easy. Um, and certainly you have no readings. This is kind of again buttery smooth, and I feel very confident that. Uh, when just enough tight hand tightening, a little more than hand, I mean, a nice hand, firm hand tightening of this uh, will keep the mount locked against the in, inner pin, and this will will, will hold sturdy. Very, very very good construction. The mechanics are very strong here. Some cable routing, you know, looks to me like uh, inside here. This is probably a bit longer than it needs to be, um, but uh, like this one's a better 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 thought out this cable sheath here but there may be reasons for that that i'm not yet aware of but either way as long as 
this cable is out of the worm gears way, I think we're fine. Um, uh, and not terrible, I mean, and this can be probably tucked. I don't want to play around, I don't like playing with cables uh, too much because uh, I don't want to break any connections. I know that's, uh, I'm a little bit paranoid about that, but I've had connection problems with mounts with uh, crappy cable connections. So, anyway, not bad. This is the main control board for the mount, and it is powered by the 12 volt 5 amp brick that I showed earlier in the video. This is power dedicated to controlling this board as well as two power ports up in the saddle, and we'll talk more about that later. So you have a pretty nice mechanical on off switch and then next to that two RJ11 input jacks, one for the hand controller and the other for a serial connection, which is generally used for firmware updates. To the right of that, you have your connections to the mount. Of course, there's USB, which is the connection that many people use. Some people have complained about. This is USB 2.0 port. But you also have the option to connect via a LAN port uh, with an Ethernet cable, RJ45 connection. I'm going to work with the LAN port because I have fiber connecting my observatory to my workshop and home. And I have a, a high-speed switch up there. And the LAN connection, I think, is preferable over the USB for mount control. And finally, there's uh, Wi-Fi as an option. And then finally, there is the mini coaxial connection for your GPS. And GPS allows you to dynamically retrieve your location and time information, avoiding having to input it via the hand controller. Okay, the CEM120 has a cable management system that features an input panel, which is shown here. And I'm going to talk first about this DC in 10 amp input. This is a 10 amp input that can be of any voltage, meaning a 5 volt or a 12 volt input. And this power is then carried up into the saddle and is distributed through two 5 amp ports on the left side of the saddle. On the right hand side of the saddle, there are two 1 amp ports, which are actually fed from the main mount power. The CEM120 will also support a custom power or data channel through the aux port. You're responsible for building the DIN 422 cable, uh, but you can run uh, specialized power or specialized data from the input panel up to the saddle if needed. Speaking of data, the CEM120 allows you to bring in both USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 to the cable management system. The USB 3.0 input will route to the three USB 3.0 slots on the saddle. The USB 2.0 input will route to the two USB 2.0 slots in the saddle. Also, there is an iPolar port, which is a dedicated port between the optional iPolar camera and output to your computer, which has nothing to do with the iPort on the saddle, which is reserved for iOptron specific device communication. Finally, the RJ11 port labeled guide is available for those who are using ST4 based guiding systems. Okay, my last step was to simply inspect the Los Mandi D dovetail saddle that comes with the CEM120. I'm going to comment just a, a little bit on the design. I see that topic coming up a, a bit in the forums, as well as adjustability. The first thing is that this is by design a it's a slide in design as opposed to a drop in design. So I I I, I mounted I tested the uh, precision of the of the uh, saddle plate um, by sliding in my uh, Celestron C8 assembled 
with my camera gear, etc. And it, and yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a little challenging. And I think with heavier payloads, the idea of sliding in, whether from the top of the saddle or, or below from the bottom and sliding up from the bottom of the saddle, anything with, with weight or mass, you're probably going to want to have two people uh, cause the way that you tighten down the optical assembly inside the saddle is through the three knobs on the right hand side of the plate. And that means that at one point or another, you're going to need to take, uh, you're going to need to take one of your hands off of your optical tube assembly to reach over and tighten down uh, those, uh, one of those fasteners to secure it enough that you can continue to make your adjustments. And needless to say, balancing uh, it can be can be challenging regardless of whether it's slide in or um, or drop in. So at any rate, by design, it is slide in. the The dovetail plate itself, uh, the, uh, the groove, is a bit shallow. I had to remove the handle from my Celestron C8 that normally helps me uh, in transport as well as in uh, in 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 the balancing act. But that handle, you know, um, interfered with my ability to, to situate the optical tube assembly in an ideal balance position. So um, it's, it's a little shallow and you, you may need to employ riser plates um, if, you, uh, if you need to achieve clearance for any accessories that are at the end of the scope that interfere with the ability of uh, the OTA to slide to a proper balance position. Now, speaking of the actual fasteners on the right-hand side, uh, many of us are accustomed to uh, pressure plate uh, style uh, saddles. The, uh, this, these, these are three pins and the, they can be adjusted by obviously uh, tightening or loosening the uh the fasteners the good news is that you can get these uh, uh hand tight uh and then if you are at all concerned that these three pins are not going to be able to uh secure your ota assembly there are hex heads inside of this so you can go the extra yard and tighten it up to the, to the degree that you are comfortable. Now the pins themselves are shaped a, a, a bit on an angle, so they don't come to a point. So they're unlikely to damage your dovetail plate. But uh, you know there has been some criticism about this design. Uh, I worked with it again with a you know just a C8, but you know I was able to I was able to alone uh, uh, mount the OTA balance it and secure it with uh with with low risk uh, finally about adjustability the, you'll notice that there are there are a lot of holes in this plate most of the holes the smaller ones that you see uh, are just hollow unthreaded bars uh, that i believe are there to potentially reduce the weight uh of this of this plate or, or or perhaps it's a design aesthetic i i'm not 100 percent certain but there are three there are sets of three threaded uh bores um and the those are used to adjust the relative position of the saddle to the um deck axis so if you want it to slide and there's about let's call it two or three inches of adjustability here with three distinct mounting points. So if you wanted to slide the saddle back or forward, you can do so by removing those bolts and and repositioning the saddle to the other bolt pattern. And um, I was able to work by default. It, it ships uh, with, bolted to the lowest uh, bores. And for purposes of the C8 uh, that I have mounted there today, it, it worked out just fine. Um, we'll see what happens when I move to a larger refractor, but you know there is some adjustability here. Overall, I you know it's a quality design. With that, the mechanical inspection of the mount is complete. I hope you enjoyed the overview of its features, and now we move to the electronics check.
Okay, the electronics test is the final step in this unboxing and inspection workflow. What we want to do is make sure that the mount controller can accept power and that the handset itself is functioning. And finally, we want to confirm that the mount will slew via the power of its motors. So take note that I have the counterweight shaft installed and I've clamped the mount to a sturdy wood stool. This is essentially my peer simulator. I do this on a stool because I want to avoid any collisions of the shaft against a table or, or a bench. And this is also why this workflow ends after these electronic tests. Any subsequent testing that needs to be done will be done in the deployed mode where the mount is installed in its permanent peer location. So now just a simple pre-flight check. As you can see, the power is connected, the hand controller is connected, the GPS is connected. Um, before powering on, it's important to double check your gear and axes lever positions. You want your gear locked, you want your axes free, unlocked. And you wanna do this for both your deck and your RA axes. And the reason you do this is, and especially the first time, if you're not sure whether or not your mount tries to adjust itself or find a home or a zero position upon power on, you do not want these gears and axes locked simultaneously. You want your gears locked and you want your axes free. Okay, a really simple test that I find uh, useful uh, when I don't have, I'm not gonna fully exercise every motion of the mount, but I am gonna I've manually set the mount to an off axis, uh, you know, to be rotated um, on both RA and deck axes. So actually on the deck, let me do that now. So on the deck axes, what I'm going to temporarily do is I have the gear locked here. So I'm going to unlock the gear and leave that spin a little bit, relock, relock the gear. And now we have deck off axes and we have the obviously the RA off axes and just wanna, you just run it through a zero position, just tell it to search for zero position. For those of you not familiar with Ioptron, um, there's a zero position notion and um, there's a built-in ability to search for the zero position using some sensors that are installed in the mount. At any rate, this will run the mount through motions both in deck and RA axes, and it's a good test to see whether or not there's any binding. I'm looking for binding, any strange noises, and there are, there are none. I've run this in a couple different um, settings. I'm just going to ask me whether or not I want to adjust zero position, and at this point I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'll wait for when I get into the um, into the observatory uh, before I do any of that. So at any rate, it's actually uh, so far passing all all the tests. It's a pretty nifty GPS. I use the GPS to set the location and time, and that all worked fine. So this is one step closer to being uh, installed uh, in the observatory. I'm going to run a few more tests and some more configuration um, steps on up update firmware, etc. And then uh, we'll be able to start talking about mounting it on the permanent pier in the observatory, which for those who have not seen the observatory, the observatory is over yonder. Uh, so. I'm actually in my workshop. This is a, a coding den slash um, um, creative center for all the streaming relativity and astro DNA work that I'm doing. And uh, I'm actually on the second floor. Downstairs I have a workshop. Uh, and um, and uh, the house is down on the other side of the property. So 
At any rate, cool. Okay, so we got to the end of this workflow, and um, I'm I'm actually happy. I'm happy that the mount physically uh, was in excellent condition when I received it. I am happy that the preliminary electronic testing went smoothly, and I obviously have had some time since since receiving the product and doing this initial testing. I I have put it up in the observatory and I'll, I'll share a video on that um, later, all, all the steps that I'm taking to uh, deploy it in my, in my environment. But there's one last thing that we should do. And again, this is optional for, for many of you, but uh, I, I do believe in vendor relationships. I do believe in manufacturer relationships. Um, we're making investments in this equipment and, um, and they're making investments in their time uh, to ensure that we're successful. So I am dropping a note and uh, have dropped a note to High Point Scientific, thanking them for their uh, quality service. Uh, I noted David Barrett, who is a gentleman that I worked with, the expert over there. Um, and, um, and I'm dropping a note to Ioptron. I have a relationship with the folks over at Ioptron. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, I've owned a number of the mounts, and when I've had problems, I've contacted technical support. I have always been satisfied with Ioptron's technical support. Uh, it's a small team of, uh, of folks who care about what they're doing, and uh, if you're patient with them and and uh, you communicate well, you you'll you'll they'll, they'll support you. So at any rate, uh, overall, again, big smile from me. I, I'm, I'm super pleased with the mount, and I hope that this video was useful for you. It gave you an overview of the product and uh, perhaps a, an approach that you can take to uh, receiving, unpacking, inspecting, and doing your quick tests. Okay, folks, I'll see you on the next video.